Hello everyone, welcome again. So today we'll be studying the energy module of the Year 11 Chemistry syllabus. And in particular, we'll be looking at combustion and pollutants. Okay? So in the previous lesson, we looked at activation energy and how that relates to combustion. And in this lesson, we'll be talking more about the environmental implications of combustion. Okay? And in today's lesson, our focus is on incomplete combustion. Um, so these kind of systems where there's a lot of soot and lots of um, not complete or, uh, well, we'll talk about what not complete combustion is, um, and it's, this is what we'll be studying today. Okay? But in order to study incomplete combustion, we really need to study complete combustion first. And that sounds quite counterintuitive, but complete combustion is a much simpler chemical process. And in, all on, and in most chemical situations, we would use the complete combustion situation to compare to the incomplete combustion situation. So we do need to know both very, very well first. Okay, so what is complete combustion? Well, it's when you only get CO2 and H2O as your products. Okay, so you put some fuel and oxidant together and you get CO2 and H2O only. Okay? Now, in order to do that, you'll need some oxygen. And the amount of oxygen that you require is called the stoichiometric amount of oxygen. Or if you're using air, the stoichiometric amount of air. Or if you're using another kind of oxidant, it would be obviously the stoichiometric amount of that oxidant. So it's just the amount of oxidant required to get complete combustion. Okay? And that will change depending on what your fuel is and what your oxidant is and on various different things as well. Okay? Now ideally, if we have no nitrogen in the air, we would want to run everything at stoichiometric conditions all the time. Okay? And why would we want to run at stoichiometric? Why would we always want to have the stoichiometric or complete combustion case? Well, when we are at complete combustion, we get the most energy out of that fuel. So when we burn a fuel and we get incomplete combustion, we lose some energy, and I'll explain how that works in a second. But when we have complete combustion, we're practically getting all the energy, all the chemical energy out of that fuel and turning it into heat or light or some other form of energy. So here we have like a stove Bunsen burner, a uh, stove cooktop. It's probably fueled with natural gas, which is mostly, mostly methane. And so the blue flame kind of tells you that it's complete combustion. You don't see much soot. And when you cook, obviously, you don't see soot kind of building up on the bottom of your pan, so you know that it's a pretty clean flame. So that's how we kind of indicatively know that complete combustion is happening. Okay. So what do we do? How do we balance these equations and why am I teaching you this? Well, we need to learn how to balance these equations so that we can compare them to the incomplete case. So let's start with learning how to balance these complete combustion situations. So we've got heptane and we're told to burn in pure oxygen, so we don't even have to worry about the nitrogen in the air. We've just got pure oxygen available. And this experiment was al allows us to achieve complete combustion. So we just want to write a balanced chemical equation for this process. Okay? And when you reach year 12, um, hopefully you'll stick around for year 12, you'll see how to name and how, we know, how I know heptane is this chemical. And so just um, hopefully you'll stick around to see how that works. So first thing you do is write out the products and the reactants. Um, you just don't balance it yet. So when I don't balance things, I just put variables A, B, and C in front of the chemicals just because I don't know what those numbers are supposed to be yet. So I just like to put letters, similar to what I do in maths. Okay. Now we balance for the chemicals that only appear once on each side of the equation. Okay. Now that kind of doesn't really make sense what I mean by that, but I'll show you by example. So O, or oxygen, would be a bad choice to start the balancing process with because if you look on the right hand side, O appears once in the CO2 molecule and also in the H2O molecule. So you can see it appears twice on one side, but really we only want, a one, we only want a chemical to appear once on each side. So that makes H and C a better choice to start with, okay? We'll hopefully get to O last. That's what we want to deal with, O last. Then it's really up to you which one out of H and C you want to pick first. Um, I like C because there's usually less of them, and it's also alphabetically the first one, so we might as well go with that. 
So to balance for C, B equals 7 from the equation, and I'll show you why. So B was this number in front, remember? So you've got C7, so there's 7 on this side, and we need 7 on this side, so B had to be 7. Pretty straightforward. Now, if we balance for H, because remember we go C, then H, then O, then we had C was this number here, there's 16 on the left hand side, there's 2 on the right hand side, so how many times does 2 go into 16? 8 times. So 8 times 2 is 16, you got 16 on this side, you're balanced, which is great. And then finally, we balance for oxygen. So A equals 11 in this case, and I'll show you why, because you count these two, so you, 7 times 2 is 14, and 8 times 1 is 8, and when you add them together, on the right hand side you've got 22. Now you've got an O2 on this side, so how many times does 2 go into 22? It goes 11 times, and so 11 fits there. Okay? So that's how we balance a complete combustion reaction. Very, very simple, okay? Um, don't need to worry too much about anything. All you need to do is just worry about how to balance for C, H, and O. Now, we'll move on to incomplete combustion, which is the focus of today's lesson. And here is a version of incomplete combustion in a match. So you've all hopefully seen what a match does um, at some point. I'm sure you have. And it's actually an incomplete combustion situation. So it occurs when there's less than the stoichiometric amount of oxygen available um, in a system. So that's when incomplete combustion occurs. So when you get incomplete combustion, you get pollutants like CO and C. Okay, so carbon particles, the black soot, and CO gas, carbon monoxide, which is very poisonous. And from an engineering point of view, so this is where I kind of like to think about things, because that's what I do, engineering. Incomplete combustion represents an underutilization of energy. Well, there's a lot of words there, sounds a lot of, very, very impressive, but if you think about it, you can burn C, because that's what coal is. Coal is just carbon. And you can burn CO because you can burn CO to make CO2. So as you can see that when you burn these two, you get energy still. But if you burn CO2, or if you try to burn CO2, you won't get any energy out. So that tells you that from our enthalpy diagrams, that CO2 is the lowest enthalpy chemical. And these two still have some energy in them, chemical energy. So if, for instance, I'm exhausting them, to if I've burned something and then I let, it, I let these things go out in my exhaust, well then I've wasted some of that energy because I couldn't burn these guys. So that's what I mean by an underutilization of energy. We have just wasted some of the chemical energy in our fuel because we didn't burn it all properly. So in your HSC, it's impossible to know the exact concentrations of C, CO, and CO2 because there's another thing called chemical kinetics, which will sort of, sort of inter, like interfere with your normal ways of solving these problems. The, the combustion equation for complete combustion was really easy, and that's the whole point of studying it first. It's very easy. But when you get to incomplete combustion, there's a lot more things going on, a lot more dependencies. So you won't know for sure what's what in, that, in, um, in an incomplete combustion case in HSC. So often you can assume a group of products. So if they just say, write an incomplete combustion reaction for this fuel and this oxidant, you can just say, well, I assume these products, and I balance it based on that. And they'll still mark you correct, because it is true. It's just that the, you don't know fully the conditions of the reaction, so you won't be able to know in 100% accuracy what will actually happen. So let's do an incomplete combustion example this time. So we have octane now, different fuel, um, and it's burning pure oxygen again, but we know the products are CO and water only. So this is a very, very specialized reaction. So write a chemical equation for this reaction. So we do the same steps. Write out the chemical reactants and the reactants and the products, and there they are. Again, we don't know how to balance them properly yet because we haven't gone through the balancing process, but, so we just put coefficients, just random letters. And remembering we go C, H, O because of those reasons that I explained earlier. So let's start with C. From here you can see 
There's 8 on this side, so there must be 8 on this side, so B must be 8. And then there's 18 on this side for H. 18 on this side, 2 on this side. How many times does 2 go into 18? Well, 9 times, so now there's 18 on both sides. And then we balanced finally for oxygen. And remembering we can use fractional um, coefficients, that's fine. So there's 8 plus times 1, which is 8, plus 9 times 1, which is 9. So when you add them together, that's 17. And then 17 on 2 times 2 is 17. So you've got 17 on both sides. Okay. And then that's how you balance it. This one was quite easy, but in the question segment, I'll show you a bit of a harder one. Um, and, but there's a little bit more flexibility with that one uh, in the question segment. So stick around for that one. So, but we'll move on for now. So identifying different combustion processes. So as you can see here, all of these flames are different. There's a, quite a yellowy, wobbly one. There's this very, very thin blue one. Um, they all represent different levels of completeness in the combustion. This one being more complete than the one on the left. Now, complete combustion and incomplete combustion can be easily identified from one another, just by eyeballing it, just by saying, you know, there it is. I'm pretty sure that's incomplete. So in general, incomplete combustions are not as hot, and the flame will likely be an orange or yellow. So when remembering the colors kind of tell you about temperature, so yellow and red are much less hot than blue and white. So white is the hottest, blue is sort of really hot, and red is kind of just hot. So they'll tend to be orange or yellow, incomplete combustion, uh, and that's because of the soot and things inside them. And they produce soot, and kind of preempted myself there. So they produce soot and they're usually yellow or red or orange. Now complete combustion tends not to be yellow. Um, many fuels are blue for some reason and they don't tend to produce soot. So when you look at your natural gas burner on, at home, um, I don't suggest playing with it, but just when you see it when your parents are cooking, you don't really see much soot build up on the pan because it's complete combustion. We get a very, very good combustion and so we don't have to worry about soot on our pan. Well that wraps up today's lesson on incomplete combustion. We looked at what combustion reactions are, what complete combustion reactions are, and how to balance them. And then we expanded the complete combustion case to incomplete combustion, where we also balance that. So we'll move on to the question segment now, and hopefully you'll be able to put all these things together in the questions segment. So question one, from a health perspective, why is incomplete combustion undesirable? Okay. So when we talk about health, we're talking about for human health. Um, why would we not want incomplete combustion? Well, as I mentioned, we form CO and C as the, as the major products of incomplete combustion. And that has implications. Both of these chemicals pose health risks to humans. And we'll go through why in a sec. So CO can cause asphyxiation, and it inhibits our ability to absorb O2. So for some reason, uh, biologically speaking, CO bonds to the hemoglobin in your blood, the iron compound in your blood that holds oxygen, and it bonds to it better than oxygen does. So it kind of displaces oxygen in your body, and so you kind of suffocate. That's why CO is very dangerous, because it can link, it can sort of clog up those hemoglobin molecules from holding oxygen, and so that will stuff up your respiratory system. Now carbon particulates, so those little sooty carbon particles, have a high surface area and because of that high surface area they can interact with big molecules like DNA and we know from our experience with them that they're carcinogens. So if you don't know what a carcinogen is yet, well a carcinogen is basically something that causes cancer. Okay? So that's why we don't want either of these things when we burn or use combustion systems. Okay, so question two. Now from why is incomplete combustion undesirable from an energy perspective? So we kind of spoke about this in the earlier part of this lesson, so we'll kind of refresh on why. Well, the products of incomplete combustion have chemical energy still in them. So C and CO can still be burnt to give you more energy. Because so, they can be burnt to form CO2, because CO2 is that very low energy molecule. 
Now, if these products are emitted through the exhaust pipe or whatever exhaust system you have, then the chemical energy is wasted because you're not burning it. And the energy in the fuel wasn't fully utilized. So the original fuel that we burnt, we get some of these products, and then we emit those into the exhaust, and then they're wasted. So that original fuel that we started with, some of that energy just got exhausted out into the environment. So we wasted it. And that's why it's bad to have incomplete combustion from an energy perspective. Okay. So write a chemical equation for the reaction between pentane, which is C5H12, and, the, and oxygen. And the products are CO2, CO, and C. So this is a more complicated sort of system than we dealt with in the original first example problem. So this is where we sort of apply our chemical knowledge now. As long as the equation is balanced, there are numerous answers that can be picked. Okay? So there are heaps of different ways that you could do this. And as long as you balance the equation properly, all of them can be right. Okay? So here's one that I, I prepared where we have two COs and two CO2s. Okay? And there's six waters and only one carbon. And then so if you balance it all, you get six oxygens. That's how much oxygen we needed. Now I have another one where now I have far more carbon particles than, so I have three compared to one, and one of each of these. But I still have six waters. Okay? And the reason why I always have six waters is because w hydrogen is a much more reactive chemical than carbon. So it will try to grab onto the oxygen much more quickly than the carbon will. So that's why we always have the same amount of water, approximately. But you can see here that the amount of oxygen that I needed is 9 on 2. Now if you do the maths to decimals, if you move the maths to decimals, that's 4.5. So that's a lot less oxygen than this one, because this is 6, this is 4.5. Okay? Then if I change it up again, now I've got 3 COs, 1 CO2, 1 carbon, still 6, six water, sorry. Now I've got 11 on 2 oxygens that I needed. Okay, so if you go through, you can balance these. Okay? What you do is you start by just saying a set of these, and then you balance it. And you see that this is now 5.5 oxygen, so it's almost the same amount as this one. Okay? So you can see there's heaps and heaps of them. These are just three that you could have picked. Um, there could be thousands of them um, that you could pick. Uh, but these ones are nice, simple ones that you can deal with first. Okay. So as an exercise, try making some more of these. Um, and then you can see if, if they balance. And then that, they, they could very well be true. They could have happened. So that's the beauty of incomplete combustion reaction questions. You can sort of have a lot of flexibility with them. Okay, so we'll move on. Now we want to define the stoichiometric amount of air. This is the amount of air that is required so that combustion reactions reach complete combustion stage. So it's the amount of air that you put into a system to get complete combustion to happen. So essentially only H2O and CO2 products. Okay? So that's what stoichiometric amount of air is. Okay? So now we have question five. For the combustion of pentane, which is what we just looked at, Determine the stoichiometric mass of oxygen required for the complete combustion of 5 grams of pentane. Okay? So we got 5 grams of pentane, we're burning it, we want complete combustion, so how much oxygen do we need in terms of mass? So here's where we need to use those moles that we learned in a previous topic. So we need to know how to use those moles to answer this question. So first things first, we write out the chemical equation. Okay? Here it is. So we'll just quickly run through the the balancing process. So we do C, then H, then O. Or you could do H, then C, then O, but I like C first. So five carbons here. So that means we have, and we have one here, so we multiply by five. So we have five carbons. Five, five. Then we go hydrogen. Twelve on this side. Six times two is twelve. So we get a balance of hydrogen on both sides. Then we have ten oxygens here, 5 times 2, and we have 6 oxygens here, 6 times 1. So when you add 6 and 10, you get 16. So how do we get 16 here? Well, we say 8 times 2, 
which is 16. And that's how we balance this one. Okay, fairly simple. Now, what we do is we say, how many moles of pentane do we have? So the number of moles of pentane equals the mass of the pentane that we have over the molar mass. Okay, so we have five grams. And here I rounded it up a little bit because it's a little bit easier. But we have five times 12, which is 60. Okay, because the, the molar mass of carbon is 12 and there's five of them. So five times 12. You can look this up in your periodic table. And the molar mass of hydrogen is about one and there's 12 of them. So there's 12 for the molar mass of, of the number of hydrogens. So 60 plus 12 is 72, there you go. And that's where we get that number 72 from. Just add up all of the molar masses and you'll be, that's where you'll get that number from. And that gives you 0 0.0694 moles, okay? When you do the calculation. So we know the number of moles of pentane now, but we want to know the mass of oxygen. So we need to know some way of comparing the number of moles of pentane to the number of moles of oxygen. And that's where this chemical equation comes in. From the chemical equation, we saw that the number of moles of oxygen was equal to eight times the number of moles of pentane, because there was eight oxygens for every one pentane. So that means we take the number of moles of pentane and multiply by eight. And that gives you 0.5556 okay, moles. Now we want to know the mass of the oxygen. And so what we do is we rearrange that, mo that, ma uh, that mole formula so that the little m is by itself. And how do we do that? We simply multiply the number of moles by the molar mass. Okay? And that's how we get the mass of the oxygen. Okay? So here we have 0.5556 times 32. So if you look up the molar mass of an oxygen atom, it's 16. So there's two of them, so it's 32, 16 times 2. And we get 17.78 grams. So, that, so for 5 grams of pentane, we needed 17.7 grams, or 17.8 grams, of oxygen. So you can see that we need a lot more oxygen than actually we have of pentane. So that concludes today's lesson on incomplete combustion. We studied incomplete combustion and complete combustion and how to solve the reactions and balance them. And then we did some problems relating to how incomplete combustion is undesirable as well as doing a mole calculation on, incomplete combustion, on complete combustion as well. So in the next lesson we'll talk about more pollutants from combustion and so I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.